Okay, so let's start. Um, so I want to, to um, quickly finish with matroids and then after matroids I want to go um, to the left sheds beyond positivity. So at the end of the last lecture I stated that for matroids um, so that for, for matroids we have the Hodge-Riemann relations and the left sheds theorem. And um, how, let me, I want to, I want to just quickly restate the theorem um, because we left off there last time and then explain its applications and give an indication of its proof. Um, and so we had M, a matroid, and then we had B of M, the associated fan. Right, this is a Buckman fan, fan of the matroid. And then we looked at A, B of M, um, and this satisfies Well, first of all, Poincaré duality um, well, um, well, we didn't talk about rank of matroids, so let me just say the fundamental class class in degree corresponding to the longest chain. left have for all L okay so here's a way to state it so we had um, um, we take a1 of BM ample and here what I think of as ample is the restriction of the ample cone of the free matroid on the same number of of vertices on the same number of air terms, um, which was a complete fan, right? So this was just a Boolean lattice. I had every I had every possible subset of the index set, so I had a complete fan. There I know what ample means, right? I can just restrict this. Um, then I have for these, I have hard left sheds and hot Riemann. And the application of this is usually to questions in combinatorics concerning matroids. Um, so let me state like the simplest one of them. And this is an application to what is called the characteristic polynomial of a matroid, chi of m. Um, so chi of m is defined, well, you can define it in several ways. Let me just define it recursively. So what I can do is I can take, um, I can delete an element from the matroid um, and I can contract one, right? Without um, going to the, to the details of the contraction, I mean, think of it as, um, right, the matroid is an abstract of, abstraction of the concept of um, of vector configurations and then the deletion of an element is clear and the contraction is really just a projection along one of these elements. So I have chi m dot e. And then I only have to, I mean, then, okay, so then I just have to... You can, so if you think of that like vectors and you project them to the vector squares mod e. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you omit the zero vectors? In the yeah, yeah, you, you, omit the, you omit the vector that you contracted. 
You don't, you don't, okay, so you omit, you omit, omit the vector that you contracted, you allow, you allow for loops, okay? You allow for zero vectors. I will explain now what effect they have. They basically have zero effect. But Here's the reason. Definition last time from that way, apparently you didn't have zero vectors. Okay, so um, the, 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 zero, the, the zero vectors, they always, um, they have no effect on this characteristic polynomial. So here's the reason. So now you norm this, right? So you want to say, right? You want to say something about the simplest possible graphs, right? The ones on one edge, and then you say, okay, so I have this, and it should be zero. The effect should be zero, and then I should I have this, and this should be. Um, I hope I do the, the signs right. Lambda minus one. Um, if you have a graph, um, this is essentially, I mean, if, you're, if you come from a graph, then this is essentially the chromatic polynomial. You multiply with lambda, again, the whole thing, but that's essentially the chromatic polynomial. And then you can look at, you can look at questions for the coefficients um, of this polynomial. So where, where is the lambda intervening in the... Lambda is a variable or? Oh, maybe I should. Maybe, okay, maybe I should. Lambda, uh, lambda, yeah. So, the characteristic polynomial is a polynomial in, in lambda. And, and, the, and this, the, the, your relation up there defines it inductively, mm -hmm. starting from what? Starting from these two. But oh, those are matroids or? or? Ah, okay. So I told you, special case of matroids are the those coming from graphs, All right? So um, if I have um, if I have a graph, I can take the independence matrix of it. I, okay, I can I can take the um, the the matrix of vertices and edges, and I make I orient the edges in some way, and then I make a zero, I, I make a vector. Between uh, for every edge, for every edge, I make a vector. Well, let me have some edge here. I make um, a one for if this and a minus one if these two vertices are, here are corresponding to. A, and this gives me a vector configuration, right? Yeah. And that gives me a matroid, right? A vector configuration gives me a matroid. Uh, if you are given the field of which you are. Um, Yes, yes. Let's work over the reals, yes. Mm -hmm. I think of it just as it's the matroid on one vector, right? There's the zero vector and there's the, 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 the unique vector that is independent. That's it. That is what I'm saying here. These are the, the two matroids that you have on one element. Yeah, so if I have the matroid this one non-zero vector, yeah. uh, which is the second case, where you should get lambda minus one, but in the equality, you can start to delete, ah, but you don't allow to do it when you have only one vector, or this relation. If you apply it for M consisting of one vector, um, let's not allow it when M consists of one vector. Let's not go to the empty set. It's, it's, I mean, we can also define it, you can also define it directly via, uh, via recursion form, without the recursion formula, but I mean, let's not go there. Okay, so let's, let's not go, let's, let's forget this entirely. Think of matroids just as graphs, and then just think of chromatic polynomials. What well, is the chromatic polynomial? Did you define it? Yes, yes, we just, I mean, I think we did it maybe in the first, the first lecture. Chromatic polynomial is just um, the function in terms of lambda of how many colorings there are with lambda of the graph, of, right? How many vertex, proper vertex colorings are there of your graph with lambda colors? Okay? That's it. So if you have the graph, just the second case, mm -hmm. you want to, to cover, to, to have uh, different colors on the two vertices? No, you mean the coloring means that uh, hmm? 
The coloring is of the vertices or the edges? Of the color, it's a coloring of the vertices. It's it's vertices. I think it's a lambda, lambda tensor. Yes, yes, but in the chromatic, yeah. So there is a slight difference between the characteristic polynomial and the, but it's a factor of lambda. So don't, I mean, that doesn't matter for the question. Divided by lambda. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So now, um, I mean, you can think of it as you take one vertex and fix the coloring there. That's what we want left. Um, so um, now you can ask questions about the coefficients of this polynomial. Um, and it turns out that you can compute them um, algebraically. So, so question, well, what's, what, what can we say about lambda? What, oh, sorry, what can, we, what can we say about the characteristic polynomial? about chi and lambda. And, um, well, I mean, you could ask whether it's real rooted, for instance. That is not true. Um, so the roots are dense in the complex plane. Um, you can, the next thing you can ask, well, you can look at the coefficients. And it, you observe that some of the absolute value of the coefficients they're unimodal, so they they rise onto some point and then they fall again. Okay. So is that positive? Yeah? No, they are alternating. So the absolute values. Okay. And then it turns out, if you think about it, something stronger seems to be true. And they're integers. Huh? They're integers. They're integers. Yes, you can. Yeah. This you can see quite quite easily from this recursion formula. I mean, it's clear that the chromatic polynomial satisfies a recursion formula like that, right? I mean, if you want to color a graph, right, you want to color this graph, what, how many colorings can you have? Well, I mean, let's, let's remove an edge. Then you have this here, right? So now you can ask, well, are all colorings of this graph, um, um, colorings of this graph? And clearly not, well, because sometimes these two colors are the same, so you have to deduct the colorings of this graph, which is a, exactly the contraction here, right? So chi, chi of this is equal to chi of this minus chi of this. Do you see it, Gopher? It's fine? Uh, but you, you would have to check the, depend the linear dependence is uh, in the, when you identify <laughs> Ah, okay, it is really, uh, yeah. this uh, looks okay, yes. But then, uh, what about this question about the degenerate case? Because we said that the recursion doesn't seem to hold, so at the very bottom, the, the, if the argument is correct, then it, I mean, it's the usual problem of doing things by induction, where you start from a, mm -hmm. you have to know where, where the argument starts to be valid. So here, I, I asked you about this. Okay, so, I mean, okay, so... It's just this one, this just this graph of two, with two vertices, two yeah. vertices, and then apparently the recursion does not hold, which suggests that there is a problem. Maybe, and also, of course, you have to, to, to know that you divide by lambda. I mean, uh, two different like, vertices. Yeah, yeah, it's actually fine, right? It's actually fine. It's actually fine. You can still, you can actually contract once more, right? It's somehow this here is this minus this. Yes. It still works. Why? Well, I mean, okay, so the, what is the chromatic polynomial of this, this yes. graph here? Yes. It's lambda times lambda minus one. Yes. So here you have these two vertices are just independent. Yes. So you, you have lambda squared minus lambda. All right, so here you can just color in any way you want. There's no relation between these two. Uh, uh, yes, but then the, uh, anyway, it's uh, okay. So let, let's color graphs in the break. Okay, it's I mean it's I think it's somehow divide by lambda. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so for I mean, it's a convention that yeah, yeah. yeah. Fix, fix the coloring on one vertex, right? Tomorrow, fix one vertex arbitrarily and fix the coloring there. That's, I mean, 
That's right. I mean, and really, um, you can also divide by lambda minus one because also it will always appear as a factor. And this, this is then the projective wise character, characteristic polynomial. Okay, fine. You can ask coefficients here. And it turns out that the coefficients, ai squared, right, they, they have the property or seem to have the property that they. Um, the yeah, okay. Um, symmetry with 10 connected components, you also define it as that. Yeah, you have to be careful with the connectivity a little, yes. Ah, okay, then you have to divide by some power of yeah. lambda. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, so it's not exactly what you have written here. It's just to give you the intuition anyway. It's not my, in, my main point is proving these left shed theorems, not, uh, okay, I'm, otherwise, I, I, yeah. yeah. Um, but you have to know how to formulate before you prove it, because it does just small details if you confuse it, I mean, I understand it. Still, it's not. Uh, um, and it turns out that you can access the coefficients um, of this polynomial by computing um, some intersection numbers. So the AI of the absolute values of the coefficients. What are the AI? Yes. So the AIs are just the coefficients. Okay. I mean, they're alternating. It's not hard to show that they're alternating. So um, so the the coefficients or the AIs are the coefficients. of um, the polynomial chi. Um, and you can, it turns out that you compu can compute them as intersection numbers. So you can compute, um, well, actually, the absolute value of these um, as an intersection number of alpha to the i times beta to the d minus i, where d is the degree of the fundamental class of a fundamental class and, and um, alpha. Okay, so let me let me let me um, let me give you a, a coordinated a coordinate version. So alpha j I will define as um, I will define as the sum over all the um, xf, where again, remember f, these are subsets, right? So f are subsets of um, um, the index set. Um, and I take all f that contain my given element j. So, and j is an element in my set of atoms, okay? Um, and then beta is analogously defined. Beta j is the sum over all those xf, where f um, is not in j, or f does not contain j. Um, it turns out it's not hard to show that alpha j, the class of alpha j, um, in A of Bm is independent of J. So all the alpha J and the beta J are the same. Um, and all you can kind of um, now imagine why such a thing, why these intersection numbers measure something combinatorial, right? So um, if you think about it, if I multiply alpha 1 with alpha 2, then what do I get? Um, well, first of all, I, I, start, I, I start with all, alpha 1 is just all of those um, f that contain a given element. Right, and then I start multiplying with the next with with alpha two, and these are all of those that contain a given element two. 
right? And now, if you think about it, I, I, if I multiply them, I only, I, I, I can only get um, um, those products um, where, well, okay, so let's 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 see the, the let's let's see the combinatorics of the fan again, right? So what is x f? X f is no, no, no. These are no, it's variable. This is the variable, right? Remember, remember that in B of M, I have a ray for every subset of the of, 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 of the of the set of atoms E, right? So remember, somehow B of M, the rays of B of M um, are in correspondence. With elements of the the lattice of flats without the empty set and the total set. Okay. Um, and now um, remember that somehow I, the, these 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 rays they span a cone together if and only if the corresponding flats, they were related by inclusion relations. And now you see, if I multiply alpha 1 with alpha 2, then really I start with, with those elements that contain 1, and then the only non-trivial products can be coming from those, um, from those elements that, that contain, a, that, 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 that form a common element in L with 2, 1, right, tomorrow, between 1 and 2, right, so that so I start with one, and then I multiply, and then I get so one. I have all those flats containing it, and then I only I restrict to those that all also contain two, and so on and so forth. And then I multiply through with um, um, with the elements, and then I see that in some way I'm counting chains in my in my in my in my matroid B of M, right? In my I'm counting, I'm counting chains of inclusion. Yeah, I'm a bit. Uh... So I remember that you, you defined this uh, fan yeah. the same as the last time. And then the xf are, are the same as the notation ef of last time, or no? Um, well, ef are the, somehow, ef is the ray. So now I'm thinking of xf is the characteristic function of the ray. Okay? xf, okay, so xf is an element of the ring. Ah, XF is in B of M. Yeah, A B of M. EF is, is a all right. EF is a co is is an element of B of M. That's the distinction. So what is XF? It's a characteristic function of this ray E of F. All right. Think of this. A was the ring of conwise polynomial function. Okay, so this is the the the. the the, the, the one that you discussed before that is on the ray yeah. is the, the coordinate and on the other rays it is zero and it yes, is yes, exactly. Yeah. This is somehow this is this is an element in the in the fan and this is an element in the ring, right? In this uh, ring of convex polynomials model or the ideal of global linear functions. Okay, so then you wrote that uh, something is independent. Yeah, so I defined these classes alpha and beta. Right? In the ring. Right? I, I, I basically, first I gave, you, I, I gave you a ring before I modeled by the global polynomials, right? I gave you an element alpha j that depends on j. Yes. Right? So now I take this element and I'm modding out, right? I'm, I'm now modding out the global linear functions and then I'm claiming this element alpha j is independent of j. Okay? Okay? So all alpha j or alpha, so alpha j is equal to alpha k in B of M. That's what I'm saying. If you think about it, this is just because you mod out the global linear functions. The global linear functions make all of the basis vectors the same. Well, nice to think a little bit, but think of it again in terms of the fan, right? It looked like somewhat, it looked somewhat like this, right? They sum to zero, so you have E zero, 
E1 and E2. All right. Now let me take um, right. Let me take the function, the linear function that is one and positive on this ray, right, and minus one on this ray. All right. Then in particular, right. So now you see that. Okay, so I look at all of those that contain. Okay, maybe that was not smart, the smartest version. You have to, you have to look at, at uh, corresponding to your definition. So you have to yeah. take the J containing F, the F containing J. Yeah. And so. Yeah, actually, that's correct. Yeah, so I take all the. All right, so notice that. Um, I'm taking now, I'm telling you why, why the function. Why um, alpha zero minus alpha two is a global linear function? That's what I'm telling you here in the picture. Okay, therefore they are equivalent in the quotient. That's what I'm saying, right? So the classes are. The what is the matroid? What is the? I mean. You can always take the complete matroid. You can always take the free matroid for this, okay? Because all of these alpha j, beta j, I can think of them as coming from as restrictions from the free matroids, right? All of this is compatible with the restriction from the free matroid, okay? So I can always think of of of, of evaluating these relations inside the free matroid, and so then I just have all of the all of the subsets of the index set they correspond to rays. Yeah, and now I'm telling you alpha zero and alpha two are the same, All right? Why is that? I'm well, I'm claiming that alpha zero minus alpha two is a linear function. All right, and if you think about it, it's exactly this function that um, is one on this ray, All right? It's zero on this hyperplane that divides them. It's minus one on uh, um, on on this ray. And then it extends linearly to this ray and this ray, right? To all the other rays in these half spaces. That's the calculation that you make. That's a, that's that's a geometric image that you should have. Okay. The matroid is on zero, one, two. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, I see. And then. Uh, uh, okay, so it's not so hard to verify. Yeah, it's not hard to verify. Um, and now you can, okay, so now the point is, if you compute these intersection numbers, first of all, there's another claim that these alpha, alpha and beta are nef. Okay, so again, not so hard to see. Um, so they are not strictly convex on your fan, but they are in the closure of the strictly ones, strictly convex ones. So they are convex, right? That's it. Um, and finally, okay, what so um, what do we have? Uh, finally, well, now observe. I will not. I will not go over the detailed calculation why this intersection number corresponds to the coefficients of the polynomial. I just want to convince you that computing a product like that has some combinatorial meaning. And if you think about it, let's just multiply of the alphas. Okay, let's just take a power of the alphas. What happens if I take alpha one, right? Inside the lattice of flats, right? I, my lattice of flats, it consists of one, two, right? So I have the atoms here. And then I have, above this, I have flats corresponding to one-dimensional subspaces. And so what I do is, if I, if I take alpha one, then basically I'm restricting to this, to this ideal in the post set. If I'm then multiplying alpha one with alpha two, well then I'm restricting to the intersection of this post set with this post set. So I'm taking the ideal of two in one, and so forth on and so forth. Right? I could multiply with another one, and you see that this has a combinatorial meaning, this intersection number. And that is exactly what is happening there. And if you think about it, computing these chains in the end, this gives you the characteristic polynomial. Um, and that's, that's, that's somehow why, why it is important, why, why it is important to have these, the Hodge-Riemann relations here, right? Because then again, right, so in the same way that 
we discussed uh, the Alexandrov Fenchel relations um, the last time, following from the Hiroshima relations. Now, because these alpha and beta and f, we get the log concavity of these numbers. So degree alpha to the i times beta to the i squared is larger or equal to the degree of alpha to the i minus 1 beta to the d minus i plus 1 times degree um, alpha to the i plus 1. And I will not write the power of b because I'm out of the face. OK. And that is it. OK, so that's where it, why it is important. And oh, so you get this uh, equality using inequality. Inequality using the uh, oh. using what um, the Hajima relations. So um, okay. So last time, or maybe maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was last the uh, the, the, the second lecture. I explained how you got. Uh, the log concavity in the uh, in the um, in the Alexander Fenchel relations, right? Uh, Alexander Alexander Fenchel inequalities from um, from the from the Hajima relations. So the idea was, well, I write down the Hajima form in degree one for two ample classes, let's say big A and big B, right? For the subspace generated by these two ample classes. And then, I will, what, what do I have here? I have a squared, I have a b, I have a b, and I have b squared. Um, and now what I do is, okay, now I compute, um, well, okay, so now I want to, I want to understand what, 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 is a, what is the signature of this matrix. And the Hajima relations tell you there's one positive eigenvalue coming from degree zero, and all the other ones are negative. So whatever this matrix is, it's definitely not, it's definitely indefinite. That's uh, how Eric used to say. Um, um, and in particular, the, the determinant of this matrix cannot be, cannot be positive. In particular, right, the product of these two degrees minus the product of these two degrees is not positive. Right? That's just, right, just the, the, the formula for the determinant. And then the fact is, OK, so if I these classes are on, only NEF, but I can approximate NEF classes by ample classes, right? Therefore, whatever inequality I get from this for ample classes, I get also for NEF. And that's it. Yeah, 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 so yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I'm cheating a little. Yes. Okay. And um, yeah. Okay. So let me not spend too much time on the proof, but let me give you uh, the idea. And well, the idea is essentially we use McMullen's argument. So this this iterative right. So this this um, um, hike in the mountains uh, argument for Hodgman and hard left sheds. So we have this vertical, this this model, this ascent part, where we use where we prove hard left sheds um, for um, for a, a matroid by uh, for by 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 using the Hodgman relations in co-dimension one, and then basically to prove the Hodgman relations, we use this deformation argument. And if I am in the free matroid, right, that is quite clear. So the free matroid, again, this is this matroid, but I can start just from projective space, right, and then I can, um, I can iteratively blow up. And these are my deformations. So I introduce first this one, then I blow up here, and I blow up here, and that's it. Right, and then I control. I, I know that the hard left shift is true. I control the signature in these blow-ups, some of the analogs of my flips in the original proof, 
And that's, that's the idea. Um, if the matroid is more complicated, right? So if the matroid is perhaps um, of a lower dimension, then I have to, to, to argue a little that in some way I can still define these blow-ups. So for instance, I could look at the matroid M on ground set 0, 1, 2, and then the flats I could be 0 and, and 1, 2, and then the, mate, the, the fan would be just this one, so this is E0 and this is E12, right? And then I have to argue that in some way there is a nice way to go from the skeleton of, of this projective space, right? So I take a, I don't take the, the, the matroid over the, 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 the fan over the simplex itself, I put the fan over the skeleton of a simplex which again is, um, is algebraically just projective space. Um, and I have to argue that I can define, so this is not a refinement now, so I don't have a nice pullback map of the Combi's linear functions, but, or Combi's polynomials, but I can, um, at least not immediately, but um, the way that I can think about this is I extend it linearly to, uh, extend it, extend it to, the, to the free matroid and define my pullback there, and then I have a pullback map. So then the, the idea is to go from, um, from the skeleton of, so from M0 and define a pullback map to M1 and so on until I am at the Bergman fan of my favorite matroid, and I have to trace the Hodgman relations through this deformation. And that's the idea. Um, that is, again, it's again just this semi-classical proof of the Hodgema relations. And that is what we knew um, how to do in this case of positivity, where we have um, Hodgema relations, where we have ample classes. And what I wanted to do today, or I wanted to start with, um, is finally to go beyond that. So. I, I told you last week that somehow the, the coolest version of this, of, of the Hart-Lechert theorem that we have is actually one where there are no more, no more ample classes. And this is what we will go to now. And this we will do in detail for the rest of the, um, for the rest of the Hadamard lectures. So let me, um, um, erase, let me make some space. and say a little something. So, so now you are proving something which is not the same as, so this was. I will restate what I proved now, okay? Okay, so now left shirts. hard left sheds without positivity or what, whatever you want to call it, ample cone, um, projectiveness, or convexity. All right, so we really um, cannot use the Hodgman relations in any nice way. All right, and the theorem um, that I will focus on is the case of sigma, a triangulated sphere. Of dimension d minus 1. And now the first difference is I, I, I will allow any field. So k, any field. I will just impose that it's infinite field. Um, and then I consider the ring um, A sigma. 
right? And this is parameterized this by, by, by this linear system of parameters theta. Can you explain mean how many holes the sphere in for UK? Again, yes, yes, yes. As I said I, I, last time was the more I want the triangulated sphere to be shorthand for I want to be K homology sphere, okay? So K homology sphere. Where homology sphere is really in the weakest sense, or so it's a homology manifold, meaning that the links of vertices are again um, are again a sphere, are again small complexes that have the homology of a sphere of the appropriate codimension. Um, another way of saying this would be Gorenstein complexes, so Gorenstein simplicial complexes. All right. All right. Think of Gorenstein. Gorenstein uh, with fundamental class in degree d. All right, and I will, what's so what I'm considering? So then, for this, a generic Artinia reduction. All right, um, and for and L in A one sigma theta, we again a generic element. We have a left shed theorem. We have. Left sheds, meaning, all right, so again, isomorphism from degree k to degree d minus k induced by the power of L to the d minus 2k. And then we have this replacement for the Hodge Riemann relations, uh, which um, we call the whole Laman relations. And we will see later um, where they come from. It's a kind of unfortunately that uh, maybe I, I chose the name unfortunately because the acronyms are the same. Um, but um, so, what are the whole Laman relations? Um, well, this is that the whole Riemann by linear form. That I can still define QKL, right? This is just sending A and B to the degree of A times B times L to the D minus 2K. That this, this quadratic form does not degenerate at any square root monomial ideal. Does not degenerate at um, I square free monomial ideal. ideal. And this is what I will, um, uh, that is kind of the, 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 the novel, uh, the innovation that, um, um, that goes beyond the kind of the, the classical techniques for the proofs of hard left sheds. So it's really a, an entirely new approach. Um, and so I will first follow um, the 2018 proof, and then towards the end I will I will give a second proof. I will sketch the second proof um, that is joined with Stavros uh, Papadakis and uh, Vasa Petrotu, um, and both rely on this kind of on on something that is. Um, on, on, this, on, on the non-degeneracy of this pairing in many, many subspaces. So, um, that's, that is the theorem, and this is kind of what will, um, what will uh, somehow occupy us for the rest of the lectures. All right. 
And the story starts with a rather simple uh, lemma that comes from, um, well, I mean, it's essentially uh, basically the algebra lemma. So, let's focus on the first non-trivial isomorphism, right? So, let's say um, sigma um, is of dimension of dimension d minus 1 equal to 2k. Right? And we want to prove the isomorphism, well, the, the middle isomorphism, right? The first one that is non trivial. So from AK of sigma to AK plus 1 sigma. All right? And we want the mystery map L here. Okay? Want isomorphism. Mm. So how would we attack this? Well, I mean, at first it seems uh, rather hopeless, right? I mean, how do I, how do I even describe a generic element? Well, I could um, try to say, well, okay, so maybe what happens if I just take um, the variable corresponding to a single ray, a single vertex? Right? I don't really understand it that well. All right? But um, what I understand immediately is the kernel under the multiplication at the image. All right? So the kernel under the multiplication with xv all right, from here to here well, this is, um, right, so let me be explicit from ak to ak plus 1. Um, well, what is the multiplication with xv? Well, it's just a pullback to the star of the vertex. Um, and then the kernel is just a sigma relative to the star of the vertex of sigma. Okay, and the image of xv, well, this is just, okay, so this is in degree k, of course, and this is, the image, similarly, is just, um, well, it's the pullback to the star, right? I pull back to, to um, the star of the vertex, and then I multiply, so I have a star, ak star of the vertex in sigma, um, but then I multiply this with xv. So, okay, so I have at least somehow, I know what, what kernel and image are. So, now, what would be the next thing? Well, I mean, so the next thing would be I take another map, maybe the variable corresponding to another vertex. Um, and now what I would do is, well, I, I could try to, um, well, I could multiply with this map, but it again probably has a kernel, and the image is also rather small. So how do I, how do I get back to this? Well, I could try to say, I'd look at the generic linear combination of xw and xv. All right? And look at, well, okay, so what is, what, what would be the ideal way of, of things behaving here? Well, the ideal thing would be that the kernel of these two here is the intersection of the kernels, right? That, that is coming out of my hope. I want to make it, I want to create an isomorphism in the end. So I want the kernel to be, of the generic linear combination to be as small as possible. Okay, um, and similarly for the image of the generic linear combination 
All right, the best thing I could hope for um, is that um, the span of the individual images. That's somehow my ideal hope. And again, so here this plus in quotation marks means generic linear combination. generic linear combination. So how do I describe a generic linear combination? This is where a very basic and simple lemma by Kronecker comes in. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes, Maxim, you're yes, you're spoilering. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you want to say it's the lemma Kronecker quiver? Or? Okay, so lemma and goes essentially back to Kronecker. Um, so I have x and y, um, two vector spaces. Over, um, over k, and um, a and b are linear maps from x to y. All right, and then uh, my conclusion, my first conclusion should be, right? I want, let me say the conclusion. Let me write it a little on the right. So. I want that the kernel of the generic linear combination of A and B um, is the intersection of the kernels, right? Kernel of A, intersection kernel of B. So how do I ensure that? Well, here's a nice and sufficient condition. Um, it is that I take the kernel of A, and I map it under B. Right? And then I intersect it. So, so now this now I'm I'm sitting in Y and I intersect it with the image of A. And I want this intersection to be trivial. Okay? Then this is true. So this is the first point. Um, and then I can write on the dual, right? So I can um, look at b to the minus 1 of the image of A, and I can look at what it spans together with um, the kernel of A. Um, and if this is x, then the image of the generic linear combination is the combination of the image. Right. Um, so yeah. So let's go back to Kronecker. A very simple and very beautiful lemma. You can do all kinds of very beautiful stuff with it. But it's kind of. It turns out that for a miraculous reason, it works even better if you have a nice intersection ring or a nice ring like that to work with, because. There is a small but beautiful miracle happening if we consider this. Um, so now, okay. So now we want to. So let's say we want to to prove to prove this. All right. So what do we do? Um, well, okay. So let's say B. Okay, A is the previous map. All right. And B is a new map. Right? So in this case, previous map is actually is the new map, or somehow, well, it's not the new map, but it's somehow the, the new component. All right, some of the perturbing component, or whatever you want to call it, which is in this case XW. Then what I want to measure. So I want to look at X. Um, let's say I wanted to prove, uh, let, let me just arbitrarily decide for proving one of these. So let's, let's say we're trying to prove this. So then what we're doing, so we want to look at xw times the kernel of 
xv, right? And I want to intersect it with the image of xv, right? Um, I want this intersection to be zero. Um, so first observation is, I mean, if they intersect, they must intersect in the pullback, right? In, the, in, the in this ideal of xw. So I can just uh, intersect once more with the image of xw. All right, so that's the same thing. Okay, let me, let me, let me actually, not to be confusing, let me write this separately. So this is the same as xw current xv, um, intersection, and now in a bracket, image xv, um, interse uh, intersected image x, x, xw. Next observation is. It just for a classification of the composite of the station of one per query, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Um, where was I? Ah, so now, okay. Just a logical because you should double contains already. Well, I mean, it's, okay, so, I mean, yeah. there is something, there is no non-trivial ingredient here that we will see, right? So, I mean, there must be, otherwise, I wouldn't have to restrict to a generic linear system of parameters. Um, Maybe I, uh, maybe I actually should also give the example where uh, a non-generic is not enough. Yeah, okay, I will do this in the next section. Um, I think it fits better with them. Okay. So now notice that the kernel um, of xv and the image, so this is, so, right, so this is a, a subspace of ak of sigma, and the image of xv, this is the subspace of ak plus one of sigma. Um, all right, so they form exactly orthogonal complements. Ah, ah so what you use now is the spaces are dual, basically. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Maybe you can say that consider a special spatial. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a special thing about this situation. So now we have dual spaces. That's, that's the beauty of this. So we have orthogonal complements. Right, so I mean, that, yes, everything is tautological. Everything is trivial here, but now let me still say it. So now, okay, so I'm, 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 I have orthogonal complements, but now I restrict it to the ideal of x, x w, right? I restrict it to the, x, the to to um, to the ideal of x w, right? And right, so I have x w, right? So hence, okay, so let me write it like this. So I have xw uh, times kernel of x, xv, right? And I have the image of xv um, as a subspace of the ideal, right? I intersect it with the ideal of xw. And these are now in um, the ideal of xw um, in a sigma, a k of sigma. All right, this here is isomorphic to, well, this is isomorphic to xw times a of the star of the vertex in degree k. Um, now, okay, so now, okay, so I'm, I'm, both of them are in the star of this vertex. Now, this here is a sphere of codimension one. So this here is isomorphic to a k of the link of the vertex in sigma, right? Okay, and now I can look at xw kernel of xv and the image of xv, right? But they are orthogonal complements, okay? So, so xw kernel xv, okay, so, um, and image um, xv, are orthogonal complements, complements in a k of link of vertex the vertex w in sigma. 
But now, okay, so now let's go back to the criterion that I wanted to verify, actually. Conveniently, it is here, right? The intersection should be zero. I have orthogonal complements. When is the intersection of orthogonal complements zero? Right? Intersection of orthogonal complements in a k of link w sigma is zero if and only if right the Poincaré pairing a k link times a k link to the reals does not degenerate degenerate on either of them not very to your small field k. Ah, thank you. Yes. On on either of them, of either on either of them, of them. All right. So this Konecka, right? This Konecka lemma. This 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 a basic presentation theory of the Konecka curve plays for some miraculous reason beautifully. With with uh, with spaces that are dual to each other, it's kind of, it, it, it's kind of a, I mean, it, it's a miracle. It's somehow it's it's some, I mean, they couldn't go better with each other. It's like a white wine and fish. But I don't know. Um, so um, now you see that now you suddenly see why constructing a left shed element, right? Right, constructing an isomorphism is related to non-degeneracy of the pairing at subspaces. That's it. So that is that is a property that you want to prove. Right? So in general, what you want to prove inductively, so So how do you know that so you have first the orthogonal complement care X V and image X V? In different uh, in degrees k and k plus one relative yes. to the pairing that goes in degree two k plus uh, no. Yeah, this goes to my okay. So this goes to the right tomorrow. This goes to the pairing. This is a pairing in a sigma. All right. So I have the pairing times with to 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 degree two k plus one. All right. I took a two k dimensional sphere. All right. And now I pass to the link, right? I pulled back to the link, right? I multiplied with x, xw, so I pulled back to the link of the vertex w, where the pairing is now from, of degree k times degree k to degree 2k, because now I'm a 2k minus one dimensional sphere. But how do you know that those things are exactly uh, uh, orthogonal when you take. Ah, okay, you go somehow to the link. Yeah. If you think about it, it's just the pullback of these. Uh, well, you wrote some of the relation between the links. Okay, let, let, me, let me finish off what, what I wanted to say and then we can discuss over the break. Um, So, what do you want to prove inductively then? Well, you want to prove the following property. So, um, want to prove the transversal prime property um, right, that um, for for um, for all subsets W of the vertex set of your sphere sigma, and this is specifically that if I take the generic linear combination of the x v where v goes over the element in my index set, maybe I should yeah let me let me stay with v. 
Um, and uh, then the kernel of this here should be the intersection of the kernels of the elements xv. And similarly, um, what do you want? Dually, well, dual, I mean, this is just really, it's equivalent because these spaces are dual, is that the image of the generic linear combination of the xv is exactly the span of the images. V goes over advancement w, v and w. Um, right, and what we want to do is, well, we want to, we want to prove this inductively. The transversal what? Uh, transversal primes, somehow, because, I mean, I, I just take the torus invariant prime divisors and I want to say that they're transversal in some way. I mean, it's just a name that I, I don't know whether it's a good name, but it's a name I chose, so deal with it. Okay, and we want to prove this inductively. Prove this inductively. Prove inductively. By, um, by, 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 by adding vertices one by one. By adding vertices one by one. Adding vertices one by one. Okay. That's um, that's a goal. And um, now this is how I get an isomor how I get this middle left shed isomorphism. Right? This is this this gives us the idea how to construct this le middle left shed isomorphism. And um, I mean, what I have to explain, what is, what is more complicated now is first of all, okay, so I will argue, I will argue that I can always reduce to proving this, the, the middle left shed isomorphism. So that is a critical one. Um, but um, the next thing that is more important, I have to argue that I can actually close the induction and prove, um, well, this, the, 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 the bio, this, this non-degeneracy of the pairing in some way by induction, and it turns out that this will be proven by um, using a Lefschetz property in uh, positive co-dimension. So we, will, we have to, I mean, to, to, uh, to prove this iteratively, we, we have to exploit this non-degeneracy of the pairing at the kernel and the image, or actually it's enough if you do it at one of them. Um, and this is um, what is more complicated, what is left to explain. Um, but now, I think, maybe 10 minute break? What do you want? Yes, okay. All right. So, let me just, I mean, let me just say clearly why the transversal prime property, why once we have proven the transversal prime property, at least we have established the middle left sheds. Well, right, so, Transversal prime property for um, W equal to the vertex set of sigma. All right? Then I have the, the, the generic linear combination of the X V, where V goes over all vertices in sigma, has a kernel which is the intersection of all the kernels of pullback maps, all right? So V in sigma zero. But by Poincaré duality, let me, by Poincaré duality, duality, this intersection must be zero. So if you've proven the transversal prime property, property for the entire vertex set, this must be zero, therefore, the kernel of this generic linear combination will be zero. Therefore, all right, if we prove the transversal property, we are done. That is it. So, um, let me go to, um, well now actually what we want to do is we want to prove this non-degeneracy of the pairing at a subspace. All right, and this is what 
I call bias pairing theory. Um, and um, yeah, okay. I, mean, I, will, I will go over um, this theory of, of, of understanding um, the, the, the Poincaré pairing at subspaces a little. Um, maybe um, before I do that, I should do a little, I, I, should, I should explain why the genericity of this theta is necessary. So this was something. Why should theta be generic? Theta be generic. Um, so let me construct um, a sphere sigma together with uh, a linear system of parameters theta um, that is where, where the genericity of theta is necessary. And the trick is to start with something, uh, to start with a very simple sphere and uh, theta that is not a good linear system of parameters. So let me start with the following sphere. By the way, your genericity, will, so you have theta and then linear L, but is it genericity for the pair? It's genericity for the for the pair. So yes. both theta and L, or theta, theta, theta comma L has to be generic. In the sense of uh, the sum of of the least to power. Yes. Yeah. So why should theta be generic? Why? And I want to say that there is a bad theta, or that there are spheres with bad theta. So I start with the um, with the following sphere. So sigma, the boundary of the um, right the simplex um, on four vertices, 0, 1, 2, 3. And I take the boundary of that. All right, so this is geometrically just a tetrahedron. OK. Um, and now, what can I do with this? Well. I want to take the following linear system of parameters, um, and this should be th this is just given by the following matrix, um, and it's here. I mean, it's just let me just be naive. So zero, one, two, three. So I have some generic entries here. I have some generic entries here. Um, so how many do I need? I, well, I, the linear system of parameters it should be of length three. So, um, well, I should be I sh should add more generic entries here, but let me just add zero here. So this is my linear system of parameters schematically: some generic vector, some generic vector, zero. Of course, that's not a linear system of parameters, right? This is not a linear system of parameters for this sphere. Clearly, because the last linear form is zero. So let me, let me not cheat and make it into a linear system of parameters. Um, well, what I do is I take a stellar subdivision at every facet. All right, and this introduces... What do you mean a system of parameters in the sense of commutative algebra? Yes, in the sense of commutative algebra. So it's, it's, it's three linear forms, one of which is trivial. Right? And if I take the quotient of the, by them, the cool dimension of this object is not zero, right? So k of sigma has cool dimension three. Okay, and yeah. it is graded, okay. And you want uh, to look at linear forms which form uh, a system of parameters in the sense of commutative algebra, so the quotient is higher dimensional. Yeah. But if you take the, the ones that you have written, which are what, which are? It's some generic vector here, some generic vector here, um, and then zero, the zero vector. Generic vector where? I mean, it's just a generic element of, of K1. Okay. Right? Gener another generic element of yeah. K1, and then just the zero vector. 
It's not a linear system of parameters. It's quite correct. Oh, of course, yes. Yeah. Be, yeah. yeah. So that's not a linear system of parameters. But ma let me make it into one by taking the stellar subdivision at every single one of these faces. The stellar subdivision at every single triangle. All right, this introduces me four new vertices. Let me call them zero prime for the vertex op opposite to zero, one prime for the vertex opposite to one, two prime for the vertex opposite to two, and three prime for the vertex opposite to three in the tetrahedron. All right? So if this is vertex zero, then zero prime is this vertex here. Because it, well, it's resulted from the, um, from the stellar subdivision, right, of right, the blow up um, of the triangle opposite to zero. And then what I do is I just take generic, I, I take this theta and I extend it generically here, extend it generically here, and I extend it generically here. Okay? All right, so now I have a theta on 0, 1, 2, 3, and 0 prime to 3 prime. Okay, and it turns out that now I'm a linear system of parameters. If you remember, the condition for being a linear system of parameters was that if I take a minor corresponding to a face, then it has to be of full rank. So before I had the minors corresponding to these triangles, before I subdivided, and they were not of full rank. But now, these faces, or the original faces, 0, 1, 2, it doesn't exist anymore. I subdivided, right? So the triangle doesn't exist anymore. The only, f uh, the only faces that exist, they involve at least one. So this here must be the vertex 3 prime. So they must involve 0, 2, 3 prime. Right? They always involve one of the vertices prime. Right? And now, so 0, 2, 3 prime, this will be, if I choose this all generically in K1, will be of full rank, will be of rank 3. So that is now a linear system of parameters in the sense of commutative algebra. Um, so why now can claim, right? So this, this subdivision, let me call it sigma prime, with this new linear system of, par par of parameters theta prime. I claim... Right. Even though this quotient now is a finite dimensional vector space, so this is a linear system of parameters, that this can never satisfy um, the left shed's property. All right? And for this, let us look at um, the quotient. So let us look at A of sigma intersection sigma prime with respect to this linear system of parameters theta. All right, this is a quotient of A sigma prime. I'm sorry, so you say that this is, is, that this theta prime is generated for sigma prime. This theta prime, sorry, what? I'm confused. It's theta prime. Yeah. It's generic for sigma prime. Yes. But you still you say that it's, it doesn't stay verified as a. It well, I mean, it's I mean, it, it is. Um, well, it is not. What, what do you mean? It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not a generic linear system because it's still zero. Right. It's still rather degenerate on some of the vertices. Sigma intersection sigma prime. Well, this is just. I mean, the the right. I. I took all these, I took the original sigma and I subdivided some faces. So what, I, what is intersection? Well, these are just the, the original vertices and the original edges that I have. Right? Uh, we saw the two, we saw the two. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Right, this is just, um, well, if you want, this is just, this is just uh, the graph. A complete graph on the vertices 0, 1, 2, 3. Right? Okay. So now, okay, so let's, let's compute this. What is, what is a, uh, a2 of this and a1 of this? All right. Sigma intersection sigma prime.
Well, I mean, essentially this is just A of sigma with the original linear system of parameters theta that I had, right? Restricted to degree two, because I mean, degree two, that is just what I have on the edges. Degree one is just what I have on the vertices. And so I just have the original linear system of parameters theta here, right? So this here, this was my original theta, and I extended it to theta prime. Um, so what is it? Well, this is, okay, I start with the free polynomial ring on four variables, and then I mod out, um, well, I mod out two linear forms. The third one is trivial. So what I have um, um, here is, well, this is isomorphic to a vector space over k that is three-dimensional, right? This here, well, I'm missing, I'm missing one linear form, so this is isomorphic to a vector space k2, right? But now I see that I can never have a left shed element on sigma prime. Why? Well, if I had a left shed element, then I would have sigma prime, if I had a left shed here, right, then I would have an isomorphism from here to here. In particular, I would have a surjection from here to here, right, just by the commutative diagram of the, restrict of the restrictions. Okay? But no, from, from A1 to A2. Yeah. Ah. And then, you co and then the dimensions contradict each other. Yeah, sorry. You're right. Sorry? Yeah. The other way around. So I have the isomorphism here. Yeah, otherwise it wouldn't be a contradiction. Thanks. Thank you, yes. But that cannot happen. Right? So the confusion is that the, con the, the generosity by saying that uh, the faces, the minor corresponding to the faces, should be non zero is not enough. Yes, yes. So this is only enough for guaranteeing that you have a linear system of parameters, but it is not enough for guaranteeing the left shed element. All right. All right. So what do we want, All right? So we have um, our ring A sigma for sigma the d minus one sphere. All right. Um, what I'm saying is, we say that. that I ideal in sigma, a sigma, satisfies the bias pairing property in degree K if, um, well, what do I want? Well, I want to look at the pair, the Poincaré pairing restricted to this ideal. So I look at I K times I to the D minus K to my ground field. All right, that's a Poincaré pairing. And this here is non-degenerate, should be non-degenerate. in the first factor. All right. Um, I say that A of sigma satisfies the bias pairing property in degree k um, 
if well for all if it satisfies um, the bias pairing property at all square free monomial ideals. Ideals. Yeah? Maybe better use the white chalk. Ah. Yes. One can read, you don't need to be bad, but it does both. Yeah, okay. And you see how this is um, how this is related to um, the property that we want to show, right? We want to show that the pairing, uh, the, the, the bias, uh, that the Poincaré pairing does not degenerate at certain ideals. And this is exactly what we are trying to, to, to do. And now I want to, I want to explore how one proves properties like this. Um, and it will turn out to be again related to the left shed's property. So let's, let's take some time to do this. Um, And the following, the first is the following nice descent lemma. Um, so consider sigma a sphere of dimension d minus one um, and k some entry less than d half, and strictly less than d half. Then a of sigma satisfies the bias pairing property in degree k if and only if, oh, sorry, let me just take the if version. If a of sigma, A of link of the vert of a vertex in sigma satisfies the bias pairing property for all vertices V in sigma. So um, this means that um, we can always reduce this bias pairing property to the middle degree. So when we pair, when we are looking at um, a two, right, so what we are looking at is a 2k minus one dimensional sphere. And so the implication is we only need to consider sigma 2k minus one dimensional. And the pairing ak of sigma times ak of sigma 2k. So you want just the, the the non-degeneracy in the lowest dimension, in the lowest k, not, yeah. not in the second one. Yeah, yeah, you you only want it in the in the case where where it's actually the middle pairing. That is right, in the lowest k. The original thing, do you want it to carry less than or equal to d over? Uh, in the end, we want it. Okay, so I, I can state this definition for all of them, but um, in the end, I will only want it for k less or equal to d half. 
So let's restrict. So we only want it in this case. We only want it, in fact, we only want it in the middle case in the end. All right? Just like when, if you, if you remember when we had this perturbation lemma, it reduced to a pairing question in the middle degree. All right? So, oh, okay, so now we have, to, we have to understand the pairing in the middle degree. Um, and what I will do is I will go over this in two steps, in, in, in two levels of generality, to convince you that understanding this property, right, so now this is really just the middle pairing in the ideal, right, so it doesn't matter whether I say that it's non-degenerate in the first factor or in the second factor, um, is non-degenerate, and I want to convince you that this non-degeneracy of the pairing that I want is again related to a left shed's property. Okay? So, mm, let me, oh, I have some, I have some space here. So let's consider consider sigma of dimension two k minus one. All right. Um, now we want to consider square free monomial ideals, um, and they come from restrictions to subcomplexes. So we want to consider ideals i of the form. A of sigma to A of delta, some subcomplex. Okay. So now let me let me imagine a very simple kind of subcomplex. So let's consider the case where um, delta. Um, is a co-dimension one sphere, one sphere in sigma. All right. So that's kind of turns out to be a rather simple but powerful case that we can look at. Um, so what we have, all right, so we have some odd dimensional sphere. I will, I cannot draw odd dimension, interesting odd dimensional spheres. Um, so I will draw an even dimensional sphere. So this is my sigma, and here is my subcomplex delta. All right, um, it parts my um, sphere into two components, let's say d and d bar d and d bar. So i sigma delta, well, it is generated by i sigma d and i sigma d bar. All right. All right, so it is generated by the monomials in, one, in, in, in the northern hemisphere and monomials in the southern hemisphere. In fact, these two hemispheres, they stand orthogonal on each other. If I have a monomial here, all right, and I have a monomial here, they multiply to zero. All right, so these are orthogonal on each other. Let me say it in words, stand orthogonal. On each other. Hence, if I want to prove um, the bias pairing property for I sigma delta, I could just as well say I, I prove it for I sigma D 
or, or d, d bar, it doesn't matter. All right, I can prove it somehow. So I prove uh, by a sparing property for i sigma d bar. OK. So, first observation. Um, I sigma d bar, this is isomorphic to what I called A sigma d bar, uh, which is, okay, I have to press a little harder with the chalk, uh, which is, okay, so this was the non-phase ideal of d bar modulo the non-phase ideal of sigma, and then I mod out the linear system of parameters theta, all right? Um, in fact, it fits into, a, into an exact sequence, a sigma d bar to a sigma to a d bar. Okay. So these two are isomorphic. Mm. I d bar. This is uh, the non-phase ideal of d bar. Modulo the non-phase ideal of i sigma, of, of sigma. So your definition of a sigma d bar is was I think it was given last time. Yes. It means that the quotient of the two ideas. What is it? Uh, okay. So let me define again k sigma or k, a, k of a pair, k, a, b, for a, um, a simplicial complex and b a subcomplex of it. And this was defined as the non-phase ideal of b modulo the non-phase ideal of a. Okay? So it is a, a kind of non-unitary ring, something like this. Yeah. And I can, I mean, I can, I can think of it as a module over, over the, over the phase ring of A. That's fine, yeah. Okay. So these two are isomorphic. Well, it's an ideal in the, in the ring of A. No. It's an ideal in the non-phase ring of algebra of A. Yeah. Okay. All right. And this is for simplicial coverages with the same vertices, so not necessarily. What is so? What is for simplicial complexes with the same? So A and B have the same vertices. Um, they don't necessarily have to have the same vertices, but you can always think of the ideal in a larger polynomial ring. So you add add the arbitrary number of vertices. But then they, the, the new vertices, if they are not in B, they just correspond to non-phases of B. So you mod them out again in IB. 
right? So, yeah, that, that's so. Uh, think of think of I B as um, um, an ideal um, over the polynomial ring generated by the vertices of A, but then the vertices that are not in B, you just ignore, you just kill them again because they're not faces in B. Yeah, I mean that's the natural way of going about it. Um, second observation. Well, let's say I want to prove the bias pairing property for an ideal J. Say we want bias pairing for an ideal J in a sigma in degree K. Then, yeah, lemma, this is equivalent to an injection um, from J in degree K to um, A sigma modulo the annihilator of J in degree K. All right, the bias pairing property in this Poincaré duality algebra is just saying I have an injection from J to the annihilator of J, to the quotient of sigma A sigma by the annihilator of J. All right, that's just, yeah, that's just uh, an almost empty statement. All right, so let's combine this. So, um, so we have I sigma D, which is isomorphic to A sigma, I'm oh sorry, D bar, A sigma D bar, which is isomorphic to um, a D boundary D. All right. Now, what is the annihilator um, of J? All right. What is the annihilator of J in this case? What is the annihilator of my ideal? Well, these are exactly. Um, so, what's what 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 annihilates my ideal? Well, these are exactly the monomials supported in the interior of D bar. So, um, and what is, okay, so what is, okay, so I take out the annihilator of, um, of I sigma D bar. Well, this is exactly, is equal to the, is exactly I sigma D. Hence, A sigma um, modulo this annihilator, that is exactly, well, what is left? Well, if I take out the, if I take out the ideal supported in the interior um, of, of, of D, what, well, what do I get? Well, these are exactly, this is exactly well, now I mod, mod out all those faces that are not contained in D, so I really am left with A of D. So hence, we want, uh, for the bias pairing property of I sigma D bar, we want an injection, want in, an injection from D boundary D to A of D in degree K, injective. 
All right? If we have this injection, then we have the bias pairing property. All right? So it's just some all, just a little reformulation here. Okay. So now, how do we prove this injection here? So, the, so anyway, so the a of d, the a was already depending on some theta, yes? Yes. And so those, all those things work for which theta? For, for, for now, I haven't made any assumption on theta, right? It's just a linear system of parameters. There's no assumption yet. Now I want to extract some, I want to extract the meat of it. Why, what, what's the condition, right? So I want the bias pairing property here. Right? Hence, I want this injection. And this injection will now turn out to depend on theta. Whether this, in, whether this map here is injective will depend on theta. So, but you know, um, to have this annihilator is equal to something. You know the two things annihilate each other. But to have the annihilator <laughs> is exactly something you need to... No, it turns out that this, for this it's enough that it's a linear system of parameters. There's no genericness in it. For this it's enough that it's a linear system of parameters. There's no genericness needed. To know that the uh, annihilator is exactly... Yeah. Let, let, let's not go over it. This is a simple, it's a simple... This is the coordinates stuff. Yeah, yeah, I use the coordinate coordinates. But this is somehow, the, for, this is still the classical commutative algebra. There's nothing fancy here. Okay, no, I can understand. Yeah. This is the, the key, uh, kind of the behind uh, the, this is what we're using. Yes, yes. But now let me, okay, so now I want to say why, why should this be injective? When should this be injective? And now we will see the connection to the example that we did last time. So when do I have this injection? So the trick is to consider this. Well, let's try to consider this um, uh, this this map before we have well, before we take out the linear system of parameters. So I will do two things. I will take theta. Well, this is my linear system of parameters. I will write it as a linear system of parameters that is one element shorter and a final element, right? Theta as theta tilde with an additional element L. Okay. Um, next, observe that if I look at K of um, well before the Athenian reduction, K of d boundary d then, well, what's, if I map this to KD, all right, the phase ring of D, what, what is my, I mean, first of all, it's an injection, right? Every monomial, all right, so remember this here was, this was the polynomial ring K of X modulo ID, this here is ID, I boundary, uh, I boundary d modulo i d. So what is actually what is here is just k of boundary d. All right, that's it. So before the Athenian reduction, this is a short exact sequence. In particular, I have an injection here. All right, before the Athenian reduction, I have an injection. Okay, so now you see perhaps why I took um, theta tilde, why, why I split theta into theta tilde and one additional element. Well, okay, so this object is called Macaulay, this object is called Macaulay, this object is a sphere, it's also called Macaulay, all right? So what, what is the cool dimension? Well, the cool dimension here is the dimension of d plus one, and this is the dimension of boundary d plus one, which is one lower. Right, so this here, right? If I choose this in some sufficiently generic way from theta, this splitting, then 
theta tilde will be a linear system of parameters for boundary D. So, by Cohen Macaulinus, what I get um, is K of D boundary D modulo theta tilde to um, K um, D boundary D, uh, sorry, KD modulo theta tilde to K of boundary D to theta tilde to zero. Okay, so because, right, theta tilde is regular on the boundary of D, therefore I can take it out, this is all exact, it's fine. But now I want to take one, right, I mean, to get back to A of D, I want to take out this additional linear form L, right, the one that is missing. Okay, so what do I need? So this is degree K, this is degree K, and this is degree K. Well, I mean, I could try to just mod it out, but then I see that this L will no longer be part of the linear system of parameters for boundary D, all right? So what I have is boundary D from degree K minus one to degree K, to degree K of um, um, K of boundary D, um, Modulo theta tilde, and I have this multiplication. In general, there's no reason to expect that this map is injective, but this here is a sphere of co-dimension one, right? So this boundary D is a sphere of dimension. Okay, so I started with a sphere of two dimension, two K minus one, so now it's a dimension two K minus two, all right? So this here, from degree k minus one to degree k, right? These are exactly the Poincaré dual components, right? The fundamental class lives in degree two k minus one, right? So this is exactly the Poincaré dual component. This is exactly the middle left shed's map. So result or conclusion um, the injection um, A of D boundary D to AD in degree K, which is equivalent to the bias pairing property for I, right, for I sigma D bar. This is equivalent to the left shed's property Well, um, for, for K boundary D, um, modulo theta tilde with respect to L. So this here was the injection that I wanted, right? Is this I knew was equivalent to the bias pairing property, all right? And now what I'm saying is, this left shed's property that I here, have here, right, the injectivity of this, this left of the of of this uh, multiplication is equivalent to getting small the, the exactness under this last uh, under modding out the last element L. In particular, the left shed's property is equivalent to this injection. Right? Notice, right? So, Ofer, are you happy? So you have uh, the snake lemma or something like that? Yes, yes, it's just snake lemma, yes. Okay, so the, uh, so the, the injectivity on, is equivalent to the kernel being subjective. Yes. And since it is uh, a system of parameters, it's the kernel here is zero, like Cohen McCollin is, okay, and so it's the same as the kernel, okay. All right, and this explains this example that we had last time, right? So remember, 
I told you P1 cross P1 is a bad example for the bias parry property or for this Hall Lamont relations. All right. Why? All right. So P1 cross P1 looked like this. All right. And now I, what I took is. All right. So um, this is sigma. Um, let, let's say d bar is everything in this lower hemisphere. All right. Um, and then I take my linear system of parameters, which was. Okay, so my linear system of parameters, let me restrict it to immediately to the boundary of D. All right, equal to the boundary of D bar. Well, this was this is some vector. Um, well, it's it's some non-trivial vector, then another non-trivial. Well, okay, so now I'm in degree two. I mean, it's not some non-trivial vector, and then the zero vector, right? The second, the 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 the, the redundant linear form here. It's just zero. In particular, it is not a left shed element, right? In this case, I'm going from, right? Um, in this case, this is the isomorphism from uh, the, the left shed property from degree zero, from A0 to A1. And because the form is just zero, because L is just zero, it's not a left shed element. Therefore, um, the bias parity property is violated. So the left shed property in co dimension one governs this bias pairing property. That is the takeaway that we have. Okay, I think we are badly over time, so let me stop here.